Funding for this program is provided by the National Institute of Justice. I'm James Wilson. Almost everybody wants the government to enforce the laws against trafficking in heroin, cocaine, and other dangerous drugs. But law enforcement experts disagree about the right strategy to follow. And since police budgets are limited, some choices have to be made. One view is that the drug business is most vulnerable overseas, where opium poppies and cocoa leaves are produced. To make the biggest dent in the flow of illegal drugs, these crops should be eradicated and the laboratories that process them should be destroyed. But others argue that weak or unfriendly governments make attacking the foreign sources of supply unrealistic. Moreover, a crop eradicated in one country will be quickly replaced in another. The best enforcement strategy is to identify and break up the major trafficking organizations and to intercept drug smugglers as they attempt to enter this country. A third view is that since we can never make our borders smuggler-proof, the key to suppressing drugs is to arrest the street-level drug dealers and their immediate suppliers. This will not only reduce the supply of drugs, it will improve the quality of neighborhood life. Just this strategy began in 1984 on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. It's called Operation Pressure Point. Yes, I, I believe that for the first three months we had almost 4,000 arrests. To this day, we will still average about 500 arrests a month, which works out to about 18, 19 arrests a day, which is a size of 100. Inspector Thomas Gallagher heads Operation Pressure Point. It was a police response to the deplorable condition on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. For a few years, narcotic addicts and drug dealers have taken over the streets to a point where the average citizen, the person who's living in the area, was subjected to long lines of narcotics addicts waiting to buy drugs, cars pulling up, beating to buy narcotics. Literally, the dealers had taken over the streets. The police came in with helicopters, searchlights, and dogs, saturating the area, clearing the streets of thousands of heroin and cocaine dealers. 22,600 arrests for drugs and related crimes have been made so far. 14,000 hypodermic needles collected, 44,700 tins of cocaine, 180,000 decks of heroin, 20,000 packets of marijuana, and the list goes on. A central office coordinates the program. These are pictures of the monthly arrest activity within Operation Pressure Point. We maintain pin maps to show us the locations that arrests are occurring within Operation Pressure Point. It gives us first-hand observation of the movement of narcotic activity within Pressure Point. Pressure Point, please all sit down here. Citizens are encouraged to call in tips, and many do, almost 400 a month. Pressure Point base is seven response to. Response to, we have a report of drug sales. It's in front of 140... Each day in the one square mile area of Operation Pressure Point, 150 uniformed officers make their presence felt. There are a lot of associated arrests. So we have the reductions of all crimes, robbery, burglaries, grand arsons, which uh, is usually associated with narcotic addiction. Now we have dramatic reductions in all of those levels of crimes when we compare the pre-pressure point time of 1983 to the current time. There actually has been some displacement, but not near what people had feared. Uh, the crime in the surrounding area is down slightly, or if there is an increase, it's negligible. Charlie. 
15 to 20 undercover narcotics officers are also on duty in the pressure point area. It's still a problem, but the neighborhood is, is very, very different than what it was three years ago. I mean, we could not ride around in this neighborhood before pressure point without seeing some kind of drug dealing going on. It would be impossible. See how these buildings are over here? This is the way the buildings were on the other side, like this. Now, inside you'll find all glassine envelopes. You'll find some old syringes. You'll find some blood-stained pieces of cotton sometimes. They're desperate places to go into. Buildings like this that are abandoned, the dealers could have a hole right in the outside wall. And they would deal to people who are on the street. Every time we see an abandoned, neglected building come down, it makes us happy. Because it's, it's a place that they can use to sell drugs or to use drugs. They become dense. Some of the older buildings that aren't in total disrepair are being updated, like this one here. Cleaned up, new stores. Next wire, number two. Give me 35 feet, please. Local businessman Pablo Mary. It was hell, you know, it was very disgusting. I had people dealing all over the place, right in front of my place. I had a big, big uh, spot, you know. And um, the operation, the uh, pressure point has worked for me, and it's worked for everybody, I guess. It's, it's, it's very good. But Mary and many other residents fear that the program will let up at a time they need it increased. You know, it's not enough. We need more, more pressure. We need more pressure in the streets, uh, in the avenues, in the street, between the streets, that's where most of the business is going on. And if they, they loosen up their the, the belts, how you say it, you know, this is going to come back because uh, the bat never goes away, it's always there. But if you keep it away, that's the only thing, you know, just keep it on, keep it all the way on. That's the only way. That's what I want you to say. The neighborhood always had good people living in it, and those good people, the streets didn't belong to them. In some instances, the buildings they lived in didn't belong to them. And uh, it's great. It's great to see the difference, and it's a tremendous difference. It's, a, it's the biggest difference I've ever seen in any area, any area this size. It doesn't mean that the drugs are gone. They're still here, but it's like two different neighborhoods. With me now to discuss these matters are Mark Kleiman, research fellow with the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Mark Moore, professor at Harvard University, and John Law, administrator of the United States Drug Enforcement Agency. Mark Kleiman, what happened to the heroin market in Operation Pressure Point on the Lower East Side? It went from a situation where it was easy to buy, where people didn't know the neighborhood, knew that it was a safe place to come, an easy place to score, uh, to a situation where there's almost certainly uh, a residual heroin market on the Lower East Side. But it's much harder to find uh, if you're a stranger or, or even if you're a local. The police officer we heard on the tape said that this has not been displaced to another neighborhood. Do you agree with that? It certainly hasn't been entirely displaced. Uh, and there's, there's two kinds of evidence for that. Uh, one is that uh, talking with users, people in the treatment business say that people are afraid to go, that the, the alternative places in New York City to buy heroin look like dangerous places. There are a lot of people who would go to the Lower East Side where the, the drug dealers were well enough organized to prevent property crimes against customers. Um, people would go there who would not go to uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant or Central Harlem. What was the characteristic of the Lower East Side dealers that made it possible for them to organize the trade so that middle class people felt safe in going there to buy? I don't know. Uh, very little is known about who ran the dealing operations on the Lower East Side. There, there clearly were street-level dealers who were employees of higher-level people. There were foremen who came around. There were line monitors, and people actually lined up, waiting in line to buy drugs. And there were people who made sure that people didn't cut in. Just like at a supermarket, take a number and wait your line. Uh, almost, mm -hmm. almost. Um, and but because of the strategy of pressure points which was to go after the street-level dealers and, for that matter, the users, and essentially make the streets inhospitable to dealing. 
as opposed to a strategy of working up the chain to try to find out who the, the high-level dealers were. Very little is known about what the structure of that market was. Based on your research in this area, are you suggesting that Operation Pressure Point might not work as well in a different kind of community? I, there's not evidence for that yet. Um, the, the you said people might not, I'd always be afraid to go to Bedford Stuyvesant. Does that mean that if we broke up the dealing there, we might not have as big an effect as we did in the Lower East Side of Manhattan? No, I, I don't think it means that because because uh, it's probably probably true that, that the pressure point operation discouraged a lot of suburbanites from coming in. Um, but even if you take two areas comparably dangerous to walk in from the point of view of an outsider, from the point of view of people who live there, who live in Bedford Stuyvesant and buy their drugs there, Bedford Stuyvesant is a lot safer than Central Harlem. That's the place to be. Now, the addicts and the dealers who were the object of Operation Pressure Point, did many of them move into treatment programs as a consequence of the market drying up? Many of them tried. Uh, there were, was, there had always been some shortage of methadone facilities in New York ever since the cutbacks in 1981. Uh, and that was intensified by the fear of AIDS, which is uh, rampant among heroin users in New York City, as it should be. Uh, but Particularly in the Lower East Side, that problem went from bad to terrible. That is, people were really crowding into the treatment programs as as of the beginning of Pressure Point. So some people tried to go into into that kind of treatment, and there was a there was a limit on that. In addition, there are uh, low resource AA type programs, which had some success recruiting among arrestees. Now this uh, program has, as I understand it, its principal focus on heroin. Is that correct? Uh, Though there were some cocaine dealers who were also arrested. What I'm trying to get at is, is the market for heroin and the market for cocaine at the retail level essentially the same, or are they different? They're different. They're connected. There are two pieces of the retail cocaine market, uh, basically depending on who the customers are. Uh, wealthy cocaine buyers buy in bars and at ski resorts and in each other's living rooms. Uh, those kinds of dealing are not susceptible to pressure point type, type operations. There is a different heroin market uh, of people who look very much like, a different, a different cocaine. cocaine market, of people who look very much like heroin users, and in, and in many cases are both heroin and cocaine users, that goes on the street that looks like heroin dealing and that frequently involves the same dealers. And that part of the cocaine market was hit by pressure point and can hit, be hit by comparable operations. Thank you. Let me turn to John Lawn and ask him, what do you think should be the chief focus for the federal role in drug enforcement? I think our enforcement role should be a dual role. I think uh, our focus should be on the major trafficking organizations. And historically, in attacking the major trafficking organizations, uh, the organizers uh, of the trafficking activity, we spent less time than we should have spent on the seizure of assets. We believe that in attacking the major traffickers and trafficking organizations, we should also uh, place our resources uh, against the assets of the trafficking organizations. Traditionally, when a major trafficker has been taken off the street and sent uh, to confinement, he or she either continues their criminal activity from the penal institution or has someone fill in for them. And with the taking of assets, uh, we find that that has a, an absolutely crippling effect on the organization. This taking of assets, is that something that has been newly authorized by a change in federal law? No, the, the asset, uh, well, in the, the Comprehensive Crime Bill of 1984 uh, made the, the uh, asset seizures uh, more welcome to law enforcement because if uh, state and local law enforcement personnel work with the federal establishment, with DEA or with the FBI, and during the course of that investigation, a million dollars was seized. That money, based upon the legislation uh, enacted under the Comprehensive Crime Bill, that money can then be shared by the federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies and can be used in the law enforcement process. We've been talking about drug trafficking, but let me now ask you about crop eradication and attempts to suppress overseas production. Is this a useful strategy? Or does it simply move the country of supply from one place in the globe to another? No, it certainly is a useful strategy. 
uh, it, is, it is one of the major components of the federal strategy, uh, and that is international cooperation. But uh, as, as you had indicated at the outset, if a given country is a, a predominant supplier and that country takes action against the source of supply because of the demand for drugs that we have in the United States, some other country will fill that void. Do you find it easy to explain your colleagues in foreign nations when you're urging to take steps against their drug producers? The fact that we seem to have a large supply of users in this country. I find it less difficult to explain now than I did five years ago, for example, because in the traditional source countries, there was not a, a real or growing addict population. Now we find that the phenomenon uh, of increasing addict populations is worldwide. Five years ago in Pakistan, the government of Pakistan believed they had an addict population of about 5,000. Now they're admitting to an addict population of 450,000. Let me turn quickly to another element of the possible federal strategy. Uh, not long ago you were quoted in a major newspaper as follows. If we could miraculously put military people arm to arm to surround the United States to keep out cocaine and heroin, we would continue to have a substantial drug problem. Is that your view? Yes, it is. It is because what too few of our citizens realize, uh, we have a substantial appetite for drugs over and above cocaine and, and heroin and, and, and marijuana. Uh, more than 50% of the deaths in this country caused by overdoses is caused by either illicit drugs in the illicit market or clandestinely manufactured drugs. And even among the heroin addict population and the uh, cocaine population, if there is a paucity of, of heroin or of cocaine, uh, the individual user will go into uh, another substance, a substance that is predominantly manufactured in the United States. Given the pressure of the federal government and the greatly increased number of seizures, uh, arrests, uh, and asset seizures, why is it that the price of cocaine that people pay on the street has for a number of years been declining, indicating that it's not hard to get? Because, quite frankly, cocaine is not hard to get. In, in spite of the, the massive eff efforts uh, against uh, cocaine coming into the country, our citizen appetite for cocaine is increasing. Over the past three years, we've had a 38% 30, increase in our, in our cocaine-using population. Uh, 37 million Americans uh, are, have used an illicit sub substance in the past year. Mark Moore, you've heard this discussion. You've been involved in uh, drug research for many, many years. Where do you think should be the focus of our law enforcement efforts? Well, I think that uh, the two forms represented by uh, Mr. Carmen and uh, Mr. Long are, in many respects, the most promising uh, ones. I think that the objection to, and those being street-level enforcement and uh, efforts against major trafficking uh, networks, I think the difficulty with interdiction are those that Mr. Long stated, that uh, it's very hard to prevent the drugs coming uh, through the border, and even if we were successful in doing that, uh, there's a reasonable amount of domestic production, and that can become more available if, uh, if we began succeeding uh, in interdiction efforts. With respect to the suppression of foreign crops, um, I guess I'm a little bit more pessimistic than Mr. Vaughan. I regard that as only occasionally an opportunity for the American government. Uh, when it becomes an opportunity because a foreign government becomes committed to uh, doing something about it, uh, it's important that we have troops in the field that are prepared to help them uh, accomplish their newly discovered goal. Could I just interrupt? In 1972, there was a shortage of heroin in the United States because yeah. the Turkish opium uh, uh, crop had been suppressed and the laboratories in France had been suppressed. Since then, have there been any comparable successes? Well, I think that there were, there was a period of time, I think, when the Mexican government uh, made, opened up and created an opportunity for us to uh, operate successfully in Mexico and to prevent the rapid uh, replacement of the, uh, uh, the Turkish uh, connection that had been disrupted. But I think what history tells us about it is that that will come, that opportunity will come up occasionally. And if it's going to come up occasionally, the right way to maximize the opportunity that that represents is to have our uh, agents and our people deployed throughout the world waiting for those opportunities to arise and then in position to seize it. But I don't think it can be the basis of a sustained effort on the part of the United States government. It has to be opportunistic. Let me focus for a moment on <clears throat> your agreement with John Lon about the virtues of going after major traffickers. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't it the case that one trafficking network can be rather easily replaced by another trafficking network? 
my view about that is to a certain extent they can be replaced but my judgment is that this is the hardest thing for uh, to be put together in a uh, drug trafficking and drug distribution uh, system when I think about the things that might be a long run short supply and therefore decisive in influencing the total amount of drugs that can come to the United States the thing that it seems to me is the thing that is in shortest supply in the long run is the ability to make a deal, an illegal deal involving large amounts of money uh, in confidence. Uh, and that capacity to make a large scale illegal deal is attacked by the fact that it's still legal and therefore that the people that engage in that transaction are vulnerable to stealing and violence from one another. It may be that the police are only 10% of the problem and the principal problem comes from the other crooks and that's a feature of uh, making it illegal. Uh, but given that, we can also make it more difficult on the, uh, with the use of enforcement activities through reliance on both informants and undercover agents and uh, both uh, electronic and physical surveillance. And if it becomes difficult to make large-scale transactions safely, I think that's one of the major uh, obstacles to moving drugs quickly and efficiently into the country. And our task is to keep that problem hard. Can we, the, the, major, uh, the major right. threat to that is when an organization gets enough experience and enough capability at that, that it does it rather routinely, and that's the organization that represents a real danger because they've overcome the fundamental obstacle, and that's why I think going after the uh, successful trafficking networks is really crucial. Can we ever make a big impact on drug trafficking if we do not curb demand in the United States? Um, the answer is I always view the supply and demand side approaches as complementary, that we'll end up when we rely on both of those simultaneously, uh, we will end up with a smaller drug problem than we would otherwise have. I think when we think about demand reducing activities, one of the things that I've uh, recently begun thinking about is that it might be a mistake to view law enforcement as only a supply reduction effort, and that there may be an important demand reduction component of law enforcement activity as well, partly in the hortatory value of, uh, of having it be against the law and using that to establish a norm in the society against uh, drug use, and perhaps also in the, there's another relationship between law enforcement and demand reduction, as Mark Kleiman points out, which is that if drugs are hard to get, uh, people are less likely to begin using, more likely to give it up, and that's particularly true if there's an adequate supply of treatment capacity. Let me turn to Mark Kleiman on that point. Do you think that Operation Pressure Point may have had the effect of discouraging novice her heroin users or driving veteran heroin users into treatment programs? Uh, we know that it drove veteran users into treatment programs or into unsupervised abstinence. It is, there is a myth that has been fostered that it's impossible to give up heroin without the laying on of hands by some qualified professional. That's not true. Uh, heroin users give up heroin all the time. When they lose a connection, when the habit gets too expensive for them, when they go to jail, uh, do they substitute another drug, or do they remain drug-free? Sometimes, or, or they remain drug-free. Uh, and uh, it depends on the person. It depends on how big the habit is. It depends on lots of things. But lots of heroin users give up heroin. They mostly restart it again, uh, like Mark Twain said. He said he'd given up tobacco a thousand times. Let me and ask you, John Lott, you are an enforcement uh, specialist. What is your view about demand reduction? How important is that in your equation? Uh, certainly, as Mark mentioned, enforcement is critical, but enforcement without demand reduction will not result in any substantial decrease in an addict population in this country. Uh, enforcement uh, can eliminate major traffickers, major trafficking organizations, but until we as a country become serious about drug education, uh, which probably 10 years ago would have reached into the junior high school level and now must reach into the grammar school level, until we become serious about that, this country will have a continuing drug problem. Let's point to what may be a limited success story. As I understand the figures, there has not been in recent years a dramatic increase in the number of known heroin addicts, and the price of heroin has remained relatively high. There hasn't been a decline in it. Is this the result of a successful enforcement program, a successful public education program, or something else? Certainly not a public education program, I don't think, uh, unless we, we talk in terms of public education being the threat of AIDS. Uh, the AIDS threat has had a substantial impact upon the, the uh, lack of increase in the heroin population. The effectiveness of law enforcement in, in operating against traditional organized crime, the Italian organized crime figure, 
has had a, a negative impact on the traditional heroin trafficking organizations in this country. But uh, I think the, the successes we see in heroin is based upon the fact that in the late 70s, uh, there was considerable publicity engendered about this new safe drug called cocaine, uh, which has motivated a great many users, including some heroin users, uh, into turning to court cocaine because it is, it is uh, more readily available and less expensive. Mark Moore, uh, given the rising popularity, the recent rising popularity of cocaine, uh, are you really optimistic that attacking major traffickers will make a difference? If we're talking about affluent people who are ca have the capability of storing up a supply mm -hmm. and shopping around among alternative dealers, won't they always defeat our efforts? Well, I think that's a I'm more anxious about the capacity of us of uh, supply side and strategy in dealing with cocaine than I am in uh, dealing with uh, with heroin. Um, I don't, can't tell whether our difficulty in with the supply side strategy on cocaine has to do with the fact that that market, that illegal market, is terribly disorganized right at the moment, and that therefore none of the uh, illegal mechanisms of control have uh, come into place, and therefore haven't set up the market for us to attack in a useful way from the enforcement side or whether it's going to be a chronic condition of the cocaine market that it is as uh, wide open and as uh, plentiful and, uh, as it now appears uh, it appears to be. If it remains wide open and if uh, major traffickers are protected by corrupt foreign governments, then it seems to me we are forced into choosing a different strategy for cocaine, which would be street level enforcement or demand uh, discouragement. Answer very briefly one quick question. Why is it that Operation Pressure Point is so rare in our large cities? What is the resistance? I think the answer is, uh, is that the police departments for a while were taken off the streets of uh, cities uh, out of the fear of corruption and a somewhat misguided view that their, their maximum contribution uh, to the uh, drug suppression would become from finding Mr. Big. I have to interrupt now. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. For Crime File, I'm James Wilson. was provided by the National Institute of Justice. This program was produced by the Police Foundation, which is solely responsible for its content.